I am an 18-year-old boy in my first semester of college. I was lucky enough to get into my first choice college, which is Cornell University. I'm studying for an architecture major at the College of Architecture, Art, and Planning. I have always been very artistic, and architecture was the perfect way to channel that. I want to preface this by saying that I have a genetic condition called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Basically, this is a genetic condition in which my connective tissues become very weak. This means that my skin, joints, and blood vessels walls are very fragile and stretchy. My joints are also overly flexible because of this, which means that I'm at a huge risk for joint dislocations and early onset arthritis. My blood vessels and intestines are also at a huge risk of rupturing. This condition also means that I have to deal with chronic pain. This makes walking across the college's huge campus very hard. This is why I have to use a cane when I walk. I had informed all of my professors about my condition, just so that they were aware that I might need to miss some classes due to my condition. All of my professors were very supportive and told me to let them know if I ever needed any help. One day, I arrived a little late to class because of a pain flare-up. All the seats in the front row were taken when I got there. When the professor saw me, he checked in with me about how I was feeling. I told him that I had been in a lot of pain when I woke up and was unable to put my weight on my ankles, making it very difficult to walk. I always sit in the front row in all of my classes because it's difficult for me to climb stairs. This is why my professor asked a boy named Jason to move to another row so that I could sit in the front row. Jason seemed very angry about being asked to move. He told the professor that he didn't understand why I was given special treatment. Our professor told him that it was rude of him to not make any adjustment for a classmate in need. He started arguing again, so the girl who was sitting next to him volunteered to move to another row so that I could sit in the front row. I thanked her and went to take my seat. Jason still looked very angry and kept passing me dirty looks throughout the rest of the lecture. For context, Jason has not liked me since the time he saw one of our professors calling me aside to check up on me in the first week of our semester. He thought that I was trying to get close to the professors to butter them up so that they would be partial to me. His hatred of me got even worse when I beat him in our midterm exams. I came in first in the class while Jason came second. He couldn't believe that I had beaten him. He even accused me of cheating just to find an excuse for why I beat him. At the end of the lecture, Jason turned to me and told me that I was really pathetic for using a made-up disease to try to win sympathy points from our professors. I told him that I had a real condition and I would never be able to lie about it because I had to submit my whole medical history to the university in order to ensure the most handicap-friendly dorm room and class allotment. Jason just scoffed and told me that I was playing up my pain because why would I need a cane when there was no sign on my legs that I actually needed it. I realized that trying to explain my condition to him was pointless because he had already made up his mind about me, so I just told him that this amount of jealousy was not healthy. He got even angrier when I said that, and he picked up my walking cane and threw it a few feet away. Before I could say anything, he just picked up his stuff and left the class. I got up and tried to walk to where my cane was, but the pain was very bad. Thankfully, one of our other classmates saw it happen, and she picked up my walking stick and brought it to me. I thanked her, and she said that if I wanted to report Jason, then she would go with me because she saw everything happen. I thanked her again, but told her that I didn't want to get Jason in trouble over this. The next couple of days were easier for me pain-wise. I was able to attend all my classes and even came first in class when we had a surprise pop quiz. After our professor read out the results and then dismissed the class, Jason cornered me outside the lecture hall. He demanded to know if I had known that we were going to have a surprise quiz. I asked how would I possibly have known. He said that it was obvious that I had gotten close to all of our professors by making them pity me. He continued that it was obvious that I had only come first because I had known about the quiz beforehand. I didn't want to waste my time trying to convince Jason so I was just going to walk away, but before I could, I felt my walking cane being taken from my hand. My entire weight had been resting on the cane, so I immediately fell to the floor directly on my knee. I could feel my kneecap had been dislocated, and I was in a lot of pain. 
I looked up and saw that Jason had snatched my walking cane. He saw me looking and told me to stop pretending like I couldn't walk. He started kicking me in my injured leg to force me to get up. Two of our classmates saw what was going on, and they came over to help me. One of them tried to help me up while the other one took my walking cane back from Jason. Jason started shouting that I was faking my illness and that I deserved to be expelled for lying about something like this. I was unable to stand, so I sat up on the ground and relocated my knee. Due to my condition, my joints would get dislocated very easily, so I knew how to relocate them on my own, but it still hurt every time. Because of Jason's shouting, a crowd had gathered around us. Our classmates decided to help me to the medical wing while one of the other seniors said that they would inform the professor about what had happened. When Jason heard that he started saying that he had been, just been joking and that I shouldn't make this into a big deal, I just ignored him and made my way to the nurse. Once my knee had been strapped up, I was told to go to the dean's office. When I reached there, I saw Jason along with all the other people who had been in the hallway when the incident had occurred. The dean asked me to tell him what had happened. Previously, I had ignored Jason's behavior, but I had enough of his bullying. I told the dean about everything that had happened and everyone who had been in the hallway to back me up. The girl who had helped me in class that day also mentioned that incident to the dean. When he heard everything, the dean decided to suspend Jason until the college figured out how to handle the situation. Jason was surprised that he was actually going to be punished, and he started saying how it was unfair because he only did all that because our professors had been partial to me, and decided to call a professor to verify his claims. When our professor showed up and asked whether they had been partial to me, they all said that they treated me like every other student. The only extra attention I got was when one of them asked about my health just to check in. When he heard this, the dean went through, went through with Jason's suspension. He told him to reflect on his behavior and to prepare an apology for me when he was called back for his official hearing. The next day, I was called to the dean's office again. When I reached there, I saw Jason standing next to an older woman who resembled him a lot. The dean and all of our professors were also present. Apparently, Jason had gone home and complained to his mother, and she had shown up to protest his suspension. The dean called me in and told me to sit in the chair facing them. He told me that Jason's mother had shown up claiming that I was faking my illness, and if anyone deserved to be removed from college, it was me. He said that because she was refusing to listen to him when he told her that my illness wasn't made up, he wanted me to share my medical reports with her so that she would have no choice but to believe it. I just wanted the whole thing to be over, so I agreed. The dean had called for my medical records for the college doctor, and he showed them to Jason's mother. She read through the whole report and said that it could be faked, but the reports were all stamped by the hospital and signed by my doctor, so that wasn't possible. She still refused to let it go and said that I was ruining her son's college experience by buttering up the professors and getting special treatment. Our professors again reiterated that they hadn't been showing me any special treatment at all. I was sick of all this, so I stood up to leave, but then she said that all my reports showed that I had some conditions, but that didn't mean I needed a cane. She suddenly said that she had seen me running across campus in a red t-shirt, so I was obviously only using the walking cane for attention. She came towards me, and before anyone could stop her, she also snatched my cane, and she actually broke it by smashing it on the floor. I wasn't able to stand for long without my cane, so I fell to the floor again. My professors helped me get up and made me sit on the chair. Jason's mother kept saying that I was still faking everything, but the dean told her to stop talking. He said that he had met her out of courtesy, but that he now realized that she was the reason that Jason had grown up to be a bully. He said that she should have raised him better and taught him how to have empathy. He said that the university did not tolerate this type of behavior, and he was not going to let Jason continue to study here. Both Jason and his mother protested, but the dean said that Jason would have to transfer somewhere else. He also said that he would mention this whole ordeal on Jason's transfer certificate so that the colleges he was applying to knew why he was transferring. 
Once he made Jason and his mother leave, the dean apologized to me for what had happened and told me that if anyone else treated me badly, that I could come straight to him. I was very glad to hear that I wouldn't have to deal with Jason anymore. It is hard enough to deal with this condition without being bullied over it. The setup. Our tale begins in my teen years, about 10 to 11 years ago. It was summer, and my parents wanted to go on vacation. Me being a 16-year-old dummy, with both a gaming addiction and seeing my cue to living the free, independent, unsupervised life, must like a house cat with an open door for two weeks opportunity, offered to house and dog sit while they and my sister went on vacation. Some important background information is probably needed here, since other dummies here might call my parents neglectful for leaving a 16-year-old unsupervised for two weeks. I'm from a way safer and secure place than the U.S. We lived in the suburb, and I was taught most life skills by the time I was 12. The only dangers I could be exposed to would be alcohol poisoning and strains to my wrist from the insane amount of rounds I would force my poor member through during the two weeks. You know, the typical threats for a boy in a country in which 16-year-olds can buy beer. The boy and the Karen Megasaurus Rex. Week 1. While gaming took 90% of my time away, and I developed the day and night schedule of a back-end developer, I still did all the chores around the house with a few exceptions since I deemed they could wait. I checked the mailbox, and there is a handwritten letter with runes of the ancient. Using my old doctor's notes as a Rosetta Stone, I deciphered that it was from the president of our equivalent of an HOA. Imagine an HOA with a fifth of the power the typical HOA in the U.S. would have. A Hawkeye of the HOA Avengers. If it was in a sport, it would only receive participation awards. You get the point. The Moria written tomb said that the grass of my front lawn was too tall according to regulations. I went out, took a look at the grass, which was maybe one centimeter too tall, and that's the equivalent of a jelly bean to my freedom measurement folks. Same day I cut the grass, because might as well do it to keep the peace. The day after, a new letter written by the same Shakespeare wannabe came. I grabbed my Indiana Jones hat and performed a heathen ritual in the shed to read the message. The roses in my front yard were going too far out through the fence by 15 centimeters. That's an average-sized carrot in Murakana. I once again comply. On the third day of Shitmas, the true cause of annoyance was said to me. My backyard bushes were too tall. Here is where I finally get irritated. Since you have to enter my parents' property to check the bush's height, with Satan's three commandments in hand, I go and visit my direct neighbor, who I knew was on the HOA board. I asked her about the gutter speak letters, and she looks through them and laughs. Those are from the Banshee of Arrakis, a.k.a. the Mega Karen, who lived 10 houses further down the street. She had been kicked out of the HOA board after she poisoned three dogs in the neighborhood with rat poison laced treats. Not wanting to deal with her after she threw rocks at me when I was a trick-or-treater as a child, I decided to let the case rest and leave my bushes untrimmed like certain minority porn actresses often do. The boy, the planted bomb, and the instigation. Fast forward a week into my parents' vacation. After being alone for seven days, I finally mastered the art of playing Mozart's Requiem on the meat flute and decided to do something else. As any teenager would, I started to plan a party, and like the good kid I was, I went around to all my nearby neighbors and warned them about the potential noise which parties tend to create. At some point here in my post-nut clarity, I remember the saying, Bitches be fading, but a good Counter-Strike match lasts forever. Instead of holding a straight-up party, I decided to invite friends over to a LAN party so we could play Counter-Strike Source and quickly replace the white blood cells in our body with whatever was in the knockoff energy drinks. Fast forward to said LAN party. My parents' dining room smells like teenage farts, Axe body spray, sweat, and all chips in the world mixed together. Typical LAN stuff. 1 a.m., there is a loud knock on the door. I go out to see two cops looking at me with a surprised Pikachu face. I look at them with the same amount of confusion. Cop 1. We have a report that there is a loud party going on, and there might be several minors doing drugs here. Me. Do energy drinks count as drugs? Cop 2. No. Me. Then I have no idea what you're talking about. Cop 1. We had a frantic woman calling constantly, which is why we came. But it seems we are more of a disturbance than you guys are. At the same time, one of my friends can be heard in the background. OP, get in here! 
The bomb has been planted and you're the only one alive. Cop one. Counter-Strike? Me? Counter-Strike. We'll leave you to it then. Cops left and we lost the match. Unrelated though. Two days after, I get another knock on my door. There she is, the bane of all good. She who must not be mentioned without carrying Muroc's sword and a towel on you. She starts screaming that me and my drug party kept her up all night and that I'm a horrible brat who needs to tend my bushes if my parents don't, don't want to lose the house. At this point, I stop her and remind her that, one, the HOA doesn't have the power to do that. They hardly have the power to do anything except approve of the house owner's requests. Two, that she was kicked out of the HOA due to the poison incident. Three, that I didn't have a party. Four, that she needs to stay the crap away from my backyard. She got even madder and started screaming that she would have me and my parents arrested and that the poison treats were meant for my dogs as well. I slammed the door on her faster than hyperspacing from Argos Row. She had royally pissed me off. No one threatens my good boy. No one. Perfect legal pettiness. So now we are at the final act. My revenge. I had about four days before my parents returned, so I made them count. I called the police and visited my real HOA neighbor and got all the necessary approvals. Then I went over and talked with the neighbors surrounding her house. I would do all the yard work, which involved loud equipment around her house. Legally, we were allowed to make noise from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. with yard work, but it's considered rude to do it after 5 p.m. That didn't stop me, though. Like a druid on a paragon level 256, I just kept sending leaves and grass flying as if all the bushes, trees, and odd plants had pissed in my grandfather's ashes. She came out and screamed at me, even threw a rock at me. It brought back old memories, but I didn't care. I was going to make as much legal sound as possible. Whenever she complained, I just told her that their plants were not up to HOA standard. Friday rolls around. It's 8 a.m. Me and my friends gathered in front of her house. We have all the tools ready, purchased by the blood coin of my insanity-induced labor the two days prior. It's time to make her pay. We turn on the speaker, the barbecue, and crack up a beer. Speaker is set to exact the legal limit of how loud the music is allowed to be. Most of her neighbors come out and join during the day, since I have invited them while kill-billing their plants. She screamed constantly for an hour, called the cops twice, which left after seeing my permits from themselves and the HOA. That's right, girl. If you want a party to complain about, then you shall get the finest party of the Shire just outside of your house. We kept it up to the exact time limit.